Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're hitting you up with presidential succession. What does the Constitution say about it? What does federal law say about it? And the president and the vice president go bye-bye. So, giddy up for the learning. Let's go get her done right now. Look to the Constitution. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6. Let's go to the tape. In case of the removal of the president from office, or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president, and Congress may, by law, provide for the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and vice president, declaring what officer shall then act as president, and such officer shall act accordingly until the disability be removed or a president shall be elected. So, there you go. In terms of what occurs after that, Congress is given the power in another clause. So Congress has done that three times. So if you look at the 1792 Presidential Succession Act, there was a lot of controversy as they put that together because you have to remember the first administration were all federalists. And there is a snake in the grass, there is a weasel in the woodshed, and that's Thomas Jefferson, who is the Secretary of State. He's an anti-Fed, a Democratic Republican. So the Federalists did not want to write this law. They control Congress in any way that's going to let Jefferson get anywhere near the reins of power. So what they do is they actually go to Congress. And the first law, the 1792 law, uh, put the president pro tempt in third in line. The president pro tempt is like kind of the nominal president of the Senate when the vice president isn't doing his duties as president of the Senate. You knew that. You knew the vice president was the president of the Senate. <sighs> so it's generally unwritten that uh, the majority party will put whoever has the longest service in Senate in that spot. Right now, that's Oron Hatch. But way back in the day, that was third in line. And then it was Speaker of the House, fourth in line. So the cabinet members had nothing to do with presidential succession in the beginning. So the first crisis, the first thing where something hits the fan, um, is in 1841. And in 1841, of course, we have the lovely story of William Henry Harrison, who was all gangster on Inauguration Day in March of that year, decided not to wear a coat, got a little bit of the sickness, got a little bit of the death. And suddenly, John Tyler is the president of the United States. And there was actually controversy because this kind of clause of, you know, the, 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 the same powers being devolved didn't really say that the president was the president, but rather that it made it sound in some people's minds, in Henry Clay, uh, his mind, and John Quincy Adam, his mind, that uh, John Tyler wasn't the president, he was only the acting president. And he would return mail if anybody wrote him as the acting president until uh, Congress then confirmed him as the president president. And that has become the president for the president. So there's been no like law on that afterwise. We just assume that the vice president is the president at that point. But we don't have the 25th Amendment, so there is no vice president when the vice president descends to the presidency. So it's literally a heartbeat away from kicking in the 1792 Succession Act. And this occurs in 1849 when uh, Zachary Taylor refused on March 4th of that year to be sworn in for religious reasons, and uh, the vice president was sworn in. So at that point, um, technically the president pro tem was the president for that one day. And that was a man by the name of David Rice Atchison. And on his tombstone, it says that he was the president of the United States for one day, although he wasn't the president pro tempt at that point. He was the last president pro tempt. It gets a little bit complicated. So in 1886, after President Garfield passes away, and there had been a few instances where there was no Speaker of the House, no president pro tempt, or no vice president in different rearranging orders. So there was this kind of worry that we wouldn't have somebody that was ready to ascend to the president of the United States. So back in the day, Secretary of State was like a, a slingshot to the presidency. Up to then, six former Secretary of the States had become president, so they scrapped the president pro tempt and the Speaker of the House positions, and they went right to the cabinet. And the cabinet was uh, put into the order that the cabinet position was uh, created. First was Secretary of State, and then we went to Secretary of Treasury, and then Secretary of Defense, which used to be Secretary of War. I'll put a list at the end, but you get the idea. We took away the congressional offices, and there were some that really thought that because they were in Congress, they weren't really officers of the United States. They couldn't step into that position. They shouldn't have the right to do that. So that's what they did. Um, and we have a couple instances after that, still without the 25th Amendment, where we're a heartbeat away from going to 
sue the Secretary of State. And this occurred a couple times with Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was almost murdered the night that Lincoln was murdered. We would have been without a president and a vice president. We also have an instance in uh, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson when he was impeached and found not guilty by one vote. We were one vote away from going to a Senate uh, pro temp type of situation. And there's also a really great story about World War I in the 1916 election where Woodrow Wilson, who thought he might lose at that point, really didn't want um, somebody ascending to the presidency that wasn't ready. So he was ready to put his opponent, Charles Evans Hughes, the Republican, he was going to appoint him as Secretary of State and then have his president and vice president step down before the lame duck session kicked in so we could have a president that was raring to go in World War I. What a patriotic thing that he gone and done. So we come to 1947. And in 1947, after the death of FDR, we have Harry Truman in office. And Harry Truman wants to rearrange it a little bit. So what he argues for and eventually gets is the current system that we have today. He thought, or the argument was that he put forth was that the president shouldn't really be appointing the succession that far down the line. So it wouldn't be fair in a sense to appoint the next president if you step down by going to the Secretary of State and through the cabinet list. So he wants to move those congressional officers back into the front of the line. And that's what he does. And he rearranges a little thing um, by switching the president pro temp with the Speaker of the House. I don't think he liked the president pro temp back then in the Senate. So Harry had it switched. So the Speaker of the House, and this is current law, is the third in line. The president pro temp is the fourth in line. And then we go to the videotape. So of course we have vice president, as I, I spoke before, speaker of the house, the president pro temp, and then the secretary of state, the secretary of treasury, the secretary of defense, attorney general, interior, the agricultural secretary, the commerce secretary, labor, health and human services, housing and urban development, transportation, energy, education, veterans affairs, and Homeland Security. And you could hear there's a couple in there that didn't exist back in the day, and that's because Congress has amended that law as new cabinet positions have changed. There used to be a postmaster general. They got rid of that cabinet position. In 2002, of course, we add Homeland Security. And there was some whispers about changing the law again, putting Homeland Security kind of third in line, because obviously if you have that many people that, you know, Aren't, are dead, there's probably something bad that has happened. Maybe somebody should be um, the president who's ready to take care of that problem. Other than that, that's, that's the main thing you want to know right there is how presidential succession works. Of course, the 25th Amendment takes away not having the vice president problem by having a vice president being able to appoint the vice president when they're president. How about that? And a couple of close calls. Uh, Richard Nixon, when it was thought that he was going to be impeached, there was a lot of political worry that um, he would have been impeached. There was no vice president chosen by that point yet. Um, we didn't have Gerald Ford, so it would have been the Speaker of the House who was a big, you know, guy in charge really of the Watergate impeachment. So the concept of me investigating you, so you can be taken down, so I can become the president, sounds like Kevin Spacey. It sounds like the House of Cards, um, but luckily that didn't occur. We also have an incident in, 19, in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was shot where um, the, pre the vice president, uh, George Bush, was flying in a plane. He was in Texas for, for a few hours. Nobody kind of could get hold of him. So it was actually Alexander Haig, the secretary of state, not the speaker of the house, who kind of went to the press and he said, don't worry, I'm in charge here. And everybody's like, you should read the constitution and the law. You're not in charge, brother. <laughs> um, you'll also notice at big events, when you have a State of the Union or a presidential inauguration, there's always one guy missing. They always put somebody in some underground bunker under the Rocky Mountains or something, just in case bad stuff goes down, that we still have a functional government. So there's probably other examples in there that I forgot, but I wanted you to get the main idea so you could hook your teeth into some deeper study. So there you go, guys. That's Hip Hughes History. If you haven't subscribed, you can do that by clicking the big red button right there. It's so funky and fun and free. You're just going to want to do it or go to hiphughshistory.com. Check out the video arsenal. We have over 350 videos. They're fun and they're funky. And like I said, they're free, which is best of all. So I'll say it one more time. Giddy up for the loading. I'm going to tell you because it's true. Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you guys next time. Then you press my buttons.